Hello and welcome to the Reach Out podcast. I'm one half of you presenting John Stu Whiffin. Joining me always, Kirsty Eaton. How are you? I'm all right. I'm not going to whinge too much. I'm all right. I'm doing okay. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad you said that. I mean, you've been whinging at me for the last 20 minutes anyway. I have. Struggling I've got with it out my system. Yeah. Grand Murray and over there. Um, Kirst, I'm going to hand over to you to introduce today's guest because it was you that put the guest on my radar. And uh, and I know that uh, you've seen today's guest uh, in full action. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Yeah. So I met Kim and the amazing band Gaffer Tape Sandy when they were supporting the subways back in February, I think it was. And um, yeah, loved, loved the set, loved what I heard, immediately bought the album. I've never done that before. Um, and yeah, without giving away too much, there was a particular track on the album that just screamed out to me. And I thought, I think this guy's got something to say. I think this guy's got a bit of um, a bit of a story to talk about. And so he very kindly agreed to come on and tell us said story. Wonderful. Well, today's guest is Kim Jarvis. Hello. Hi. How are you? Yeah, I'm quite well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, all good. A- apart from the tonsillitis. Apart from tonsillitis. Yeah, I've got tonsillitis because I think we hit the new year pretty heavy uh, on the gig front. And I think it's all just kind of catching up with me now. And yeah, I was sort of uh, just went through the tours really, really easily. And then when I came off tour, I was like, oh God, my body was just started punishing me. So I'm in recovery mode at the minute, but I'm fine. Can we always start the podcast off by asking guests what comes to mind when they hear the words mental health? Mm. Um. Oh, that's a big question, I suppose. But I think to me, I mean, it's a word that gets thrown around a lot. And I think I, I didn't really hear that sentence much before, like maybe 10 years ago. But mental health, I guess, to me, is just the the quality of being and the quality of life that one individual needs to cater to and look after, uh, I suppose. Yeah, I think it directly correlates to quality of life, really um your mental health i think you could be in perfect you know physical bodily health but be suffering tremendously because of poor mental health so i think really it's yeah it's it's a direct there's so many correlations between it and quality of life and just general health mental health is health to me you know it's it's just as important as any other type of health i think mental health is everything um yeah Kim, when was the first time that you experienced any sort of feeling um, or awareness that maybe what you perceived as, as as a normal sense of healthy mental health wasn't as it should be? I think, I think really, I think I, I grew up in a time where it was, okay to talk about mental health and it was okay to talk about anxiety depression um so I never really had trouble expressing myself in regards to how I felt but I don't think I really experienced any any truly problematic feelings until I was about 24 and 25 kind of just as uh COVID hit as well um, and I think that's when I really started to sort of think, okay, this is what people are talking about when we're talking about um, anxious feelings, depressive feelings, um, and the importance of mental health. I think, yeah, really, I was, I think, I was talking because a lot of a lot of the songs I write, um, I wrote before I was twenty five, but I think I was really writing those songs sympathetically if that makes sense yeah. as uh, though I was writing them as a reaction to what I was hearing from other people rather than my own feelings. And I think, yeah, it wasn't until I hit about 24, 25 where I was like, Oh God, this is what, this is what people are talking about. <laughs> there was something can I said... ask, how old were sorry. you? Oh, sorry, how old were you when you wrote Headlights? Um, 20, probably 22, 21, 22. I think, yeah. Do you mind telling us a bit more about the backstory for that song? Yeah, of course. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, um, that song was really largely written sympathetically from what I was hearing 
from what I was hearing from people around me um, rather than my own. And I can, I didn't think I thought that at the time when I wrote that song, um, cause, but the song is just about uh, openness and trying to share openness with other people, We're trying to share your feelings with other people and the importance of sharing um, your own subjective struggles. Um, but yeah, I really think that wasn't, it wasn't about me, that song. It was about other people. Uh, my sister, who's very close to me, uh, suffers from mental health um, problems and and a lot of my friends did at the time. And really, although I thought I was writing that song about myself, it was, yeah, yeah. I can retrospectively looking at it now, that song was written about um, what was what I was seeing around me, I think. Um, you you mentioned it's something. It's an amazing story. Sorry, Kirst. No, thank oh, you. We, we've lost you from the video. Um, we, we can only hear you at the moment, Kirst. And there seems to be a bit of a delay there as well. Um, Kim, you touched on something um, earlier where you said you grew up in a, a, a time where it was okay to talk about anxiety and mental health and, and, and depression. Um, when you say that, do you mean that, was that within your circle of friends in a tribe that you'd already found or on the wider kind of spectrum of, of society? Mm. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, definitely amongst my immediate circle and my and thankfully my family as well. I've got a very, very caring, um, very attentive family uh, who are very tuned into mental health problems. Um, yeah. But I like to think I like to think that it was the kind of the zeitgeist and it was the um, the cultural sort of I think I did. Yeah, I was growing up around the time where people were getting tuned on, into that stuff. And it was we had a bit more of a finger on the pulse of sort of people who are struggling with mental health um but obviously yeah i can only really talk for my immediate circle but i think i don't know it just it just seemed like the discussion was kind of changing and being a musician uh and a songwriter and that that was what i done for for, for, for 10 years in, in in a long long time ago um and do you find that your experience of being around creative people in music film art whatever that it feels like a a more comfortable environment to discuss feelings mental health struggles and well-being etc yeah i think so um yeah i think I, i've because i've been involved in sort of a few different areas of the music industry i've always i'm also involved in like the tech side of things because i'm a sound engineer when i'm not touring um and that's quite a hard sort of business that's quite a hard side of it it's a lot of labor a lot of hard sort of labor a lot of late nights and i think that kind of part of the industry is still playing catch up but definitely the sort of performance side of it and, and i think yeah my the, the the sort of um the peers that i have in music now um, I think there is a really open conversation towards mental health um, I think I think especially over COVID as well COVID really opened people's eyes and suddenly there was a whole there was a whole community of musicians who had absolutely nothing to do mm. um, so I think yeah I think I think we are I think we are we do tend to be quite open um, in, in the right circles um, tell me a little bit about lockdown as, as a musician as well because I'm always intrigued that as podcasters as as you know i i, I run a, a live music venue and that was the first thing to shut and the last thing to reopen um but tell me a little about um because for me i think there was something really wonderful come out of a, a truly terrible time and that's that i think bands and people that that, that create music as as however they do it i think when you're starved of gigs and you're starved of going to the studio it takes you back to a completely fucking punk ethos of like right i have got to go diy here because i've got to look at what i've got in this wherever i am wherever i'm in lockdown and i've got to kind of create something with this and i think there was so much incredible stuff where people were doing remote concerts and things like just just look at this is what i've got and i think that's that's as punk as it gets and just tell me a little bit about that experience for you yeah i think you're absolutely right um 
yeah, people really did utilize that time amazingly. Um, especially the kind of the, the kind of the first year um, when it was really like, right, nothing's happening. You know, there's no chance of gigs, no nothing. Um, I think it got a little bit harder when gigs were kind of on the table, but kind of not. Um, we no one was really sure if we could play shows or not. Um, sort of, you know, around this kind of second and third lockdown, I think yeah. things got a bit difficult then. But definitely, yeah, you're absolutely right. In the first lockdown, people were doing amazing things, um, and we sort of it was a bit it was a bit hard for us. We kind of um, we had yeah periods where we were sort of doing everything, and we we did like acoustic sets on um, yeah virtual festivals. We did one for like Dork called Homeschooled Festival, which was amazing um and yeah and i did some i i, I like spent the time making guitar, guitar tutorial videos for some of our songs um and kind of yeah and it, and that really kept me going and it, it gave me something to do um but it was also it was really hard because we basically the, the lockdown for us looked like um we had just gone on our first uk headline tour uh in march 2020 uh, and we were about halfway through when we got the call that the country was locking down. So we were meant to play four or five more shows on that tour. Um, and then our, basically our booking agent contacted us and said, guys, we have to pull the whole show, pull the whole tour. We, you know, we, you're, you're my last band out. And I, I think we were, I've been trying to find this out accurately, but I'm pretty sure we were like one of the last bands in tour in the UK. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, yeah during covid uh, i think we were one of the last bands out um so yeah it, we were really stopped in our tracks and it was quite sort of shocking um you know we were just uh, we were in i think wakefield in this random hotel with our van all of our gear um the support band and no gigs you know and it was just like suddenly this you know we couldn't believe it it was completely surreal um and i then crash landed at my mother's house uh, in the country where I stayed for seven months, I think, during during the lockdown period. So I was just it was just suddenly taken back to square one, you know, no job, no gigs, my mum's house. <laughs> Aggression. Um, yeah. So I think I, I think really we we probably could have spent the time better because we were all kind of just in shock. Um some musicians and bands that we know yeah, really were so productive and did amazing things in lockdown. But we were we did we did we was so we did some stuff we were kind of proactive but um we also needed some recovery time it was it was pretty intense <laughs> tell me a little bit about the benefits if there's benefits to your mental health from performing live oh yeah loads yeah for me definitely i mean i'm i'm just like a big child i'm just <laughs> i i feel i don't know i've got a lot of sort of energy inside of me i've got so much energy just to my day-to-day -day life that sometimes i need this kind of huge expression and that's what it feels like to me um it's like this huge yeah just expression in this sort of cathartic um outburst that's what playing a show feels like to me um and i think really in sort of day-to-day -day, nine to five work you don't really get to do much in terms of sort of big expressive movements you know it's sort of you, you kind of just have to get your head down and shut up um whereas i need to shout and i need to jump sometimes and i need to kind of get back to basics and mm. move around and be weird um, and i think on stage you get to do that you know and, and everyone kind of expects you to do something like that because they expect you to perform and sort of be into the music you're creating mm. um so yeah, I find I find it really liberating just have, just being able to shout, you know, <laughs> just just shout yeah. and um yeah, get something off my chest a little bit. Uh, I think it's yeah, it's really yeah. We've, we've had a number of people come on the podcasts that are um, a number of musicians, and they've all said a similar thing, haven't they, Stu? Where um, it's, maybe it's not even so much about how 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 you've described it, Kim, but kind of having that feedback from the audience and. Um, I remember one guest that we had, you know, he was talking about obviously just just being centre of attention, just yeah. being centre of attention and having people adoring you and, you know, feeding back from that and, you know, hearing people singing the songs that you've written. Um, you know, that that obviously gives a huge amount of, you know, serotonin and endorphins and everything. Um, 
But I mean, you know, for, for me personally, and I know that, that Stu battles with this as well, you know, not massive fans of our own company, are we, Stu? No, um, no, and... I'm really boring. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, lockdown for me was was really challenging because it was right. OK, I'm now working at my kitchen table, not seeing anybody, just, you know, having the odd. Well, at the, at the start, you know, having the odd Zoom meeting and then it turned out to be like five or six Zoom meetings in one day, which in itself was really exhausting. But just having someone to to goof around with and to mm. to, to talk to face to face and to. um yeah, just just bat things off of it. It's 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 an entirely different animal when you're doing that face to face rather than remotely. Those glasses are a bit funky, Stu. It's a shame the uh here. Yeah, they're uh I've, I've, I've you've seen me wear these many times, guys. Are you sure they're not <laughs> Carol's? No, they're mine. <laughs> are you sure? They're great. They're a really good look. Um one of the things that um musicians often talk about as well. Is as you said that you know that 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 feeling you get from performing live, and certainly if you're on tour, uh, it, it's just a, a, a constant. I mean, don't get me wrong; you know, I'm very aware that there's the the you know the travel and the and the hours after the sound check, and kind of you know lost hours where you're killing time before you get to do what you love the most. But you often hear musicians. Uh, and not just musicians, you know, sound engineers and things like that talk about when the tour's over and it's back home, mm -hmm. that kind of lost feeling of like, oh, my routine's now changed and it's not quite as fun a lot of the time. Mm, but yeah. what's, what's been your experience of that? Yeah, well, absolutely that. Yeah, completely. It's this real um, sudden just drop in energy and routine and because even 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 though yeah there are obviously the sort of um unromantic parts of tour like the the sound check and the loadouts and the service station breakfasts and things like that all of that can become quite comforting as well because you're in a routine and you're doing it with your friends and you're you know you and and you really bond with the people that you do those things with even if you're loading out of a venue at like one o'clock in the morning and yeah um you know <laughs> sort of having dinner out of your lap in the van or whatever but it's all of that all of that stuff kind of um is part of it and yeah when you come off tour and suddenly you're like oh god what what am i doing yeah it's really hard to kind of i find it really difficult to just order my day you know just to know what to do next um and yeah and it's just for, for me as well the guys i mean i'm so close with my band members they're really two of my best friends and seeing them, you know, every hour of the day on tour to suddenly go to just not seeing them at all and to, you know, only seeing them at rehearsals is is really challenging because they come at the, you know, the touring party becomes kind of a little uh, support network for you as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, being sort of taken away from that it, it is really challenging. Um, yeah. And that's, yeah, I think that's sort of when you have to really start looking after yourself is when, yeah, when you come off, when you've got that down period and you you haven't got anything scratching that itch anymore. That's when you sort of need to start thinking, okay, I need to maintain my routine or, um, yeah, look after myself. Almost put some safeguards in place, which funnily enough is what you do now. So when we messaged each other to try and set up this podcast, you'd said that actually I'm taking a week off to kind of maintain my own mental health. And I think that's such an important thing to do. Um, you know, even if, you know, we haven't got any annual leave book to go away and do something. It doesn't matter. You don't need to go anywhere. Sometimes you need mm. to do absolutely fuck all and just stay at home and do as little as possible. Um, what, what? When did you start to get that kind of routine? Was that like you were saying, was that because, you know, when, when a tour finished and you realised that you needed to do a bit of kind of self-care? Yeah, I think I've always I've always sort of had the attitude, really, that the kind of capitalistic idea of working nine to five five days a week is completely humanly impossible i i've just never agreed with it and, and i know a lot of people wouldn't as well and and i i'm in a nice position where i have a pretty good job um a lot of it's freelance work as well so i kind of you know i i, I completely understand that i am um in a somewhat privileged position where i can take a week off you know i know that some people can't um but i do think it's it's incredibly important if you can do it and even if it does mean out on missing it does mean missing out on some money um yeah i think it's i think it's really important because it's just yeah i think we have completely unrealistic expectations um 
And I think, yeah, and burnout. Burnout is just so real. Uh, and I think you can hit it way before. Uh, I think everyone has their own threshold for burnout. You know, I think every, I think some people will are capable of working way more than others. And I, you know, I'm only 27, but I think I've found my threshold. I think I know how much I can work before I feel absolutely terrible. And that is, yeah. <laughs> and do, you, and do you know what kind of little um, red flags to pay attention to now? Whereas before you might have bulldozed through them, but now, you know, you've got these little signs and little indicators that, okay, I'm starting to, I'm starting to lag a bit now. I need to start paying attention rather than, um, you know, you're kind of crouched in the fetal position and you can't even get out of bed to get a glass of water, you know? Yeah, totally. It's that, it's that. It's, yeah, it's my, like, eating habits drop. Suddenly I'm ordering in every night of the week or suddenly I'm failing to, like, do my yoga or <laughs> things like that. And, it's you know, it's when my life becomes just about work and I'm checking my email when I'm at work, like, constantly. And just, yeah, like you say, little little signs and red flags. so interesting to, to uh, that, that different people's signs are like food is, is, is oh sorry is, that's okay um sorry my, my connect my connection went out there no problem we we, we we did grab what you you said and you were saying that you know talking about sort of your eating habits would lag um hello oh no and i think that's um i'm not sure if we've lost him but um can you hear me Kirst? I can. You're loud and clear. Oh, though. good, good. Mm. What well, do do you find that that's something that happens to you as well, Kirst? Like, e e does your eating habits change? Um, no. But funnily enough, it's it's similar to Kim. So it's things that I do to maintain my own sense of well being. If I start kind of putting them on the back burner, or making stupid excuses for not doing them, then I know for me that's a sign that I'm not not necessarily not coping but if I continue on this trajectory it's it's only going to get worse and I need to start finding that half an hour three times a week to do my yoga or thanks to you and Dave I'm now doing this bloody couch to 5k business and trying to go out for a run um yeah it's but I think sometimes it's easier for other people to spot those symptoms rather than finding it within yourself so finding someone that you trust and having a really honest and vulnerable conversation with them and just say listen if I start to I don't know if I start cancelling on you you know if you know if, if if that for you is an indication that you're starting to slip um then you know call me up on it and and just ask me outright how are things you know um yeah sometimes it's easy to overlook and make excuses for yourself but when you've got someone that you trust asking you mm. it's harder to ignore it I've, I've literally pinpointed it down to, to one specific thing now, which is so odd. And my, my eating habits are generally pretty shocking anyway. Um, so I, I wouldn't align that to anything. But um, I listen to LBC. What, that's a sign that you're on the downhill? Yeah, <laughs> which is fucking bananas, right? Because music's my life, always has been my life. And as much as a big part of my career is the podcast industry, I don't really listen to that many podcasts. I shouldn't say that because there's 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 listeners that, that probably read Pop Bible listening to this going what, um, <laughs> but uh, but I, I I don't. Um, and if I know that like music's not going to help, I put LBC on and I just listen to angry people phoning in, ranting, uh, whilst the hosts are, are pulling them up on you know talking nonsense about immigration or whatever and I just get out of my car even more angry and upset than I was when I got in there at just how ridiculous some of these people's comments are but I can't turn it off and it's because it's a conversation that's live that distracts me and it just absolutely pulls my attention in because it's you know the nature of them shows is it's clickbaity in a weird way it's like right we're gonna mention the Tories today so we know full well that it's going to be loads of people ringing up wanting to rant about the Tory party which I'm happy to listen to all day but they're waiting for the one person to come to phone through that's going to disagree and then it's all going to kick off and and it's that that I've, I will sit outside my office in my car listening to that and I just think turn it off like you're not going to feel any better today by listening to anyone's opinions on this like 
you know, I know what my opinions are on it, but I just, I, like, and I've said, I'm sure I've said this to you before, because like, if I'm listening to LBC on my drive to work, I know that <laughs> I'm having a wonky one. Mm. I'm going to ask this now. As soon as I get into the office, I'm going to be like, what do you listen to on the way in today, Carl? <laughs> this is what I can say. <laughs> how I'm going to start this. Um... Oh, I, I, I drove in today listening to Richard Hawley, so I'm feeling very zen and very, nice. very, very nice. Uh, but, but yeah, did have LBC on yesterday. Radio um, 4 is also available. What's that? Radio 4, also available. I know, I know. Did I, did I just generally do that clickbaity thing as well? Of just really salacious no, topics? No, it's chilled. You can listen to the... Um, mm. The archers. It's nice. I know I'm 50 this year, but I ain't ready for the archers yet. Come on. Well, <laughs> the archers every now and again. <laughs> uh, what's what's your goes? Have you got uh, this is always something that interests me about musicians? If you wake up, Kim, right, and you're feeling shit, you're feeling pretty blue. Are you going to go and dig out? Reach for the Stars, the greatest hits of uh, S Club 7, or are you going, right, where's my Nick Drake CD? I am going to immerse myself in this feeling. I'm going to have a big audio cuddle and process it, or the flip side is I'm going to go and listen to S Club 7 and just put something ridiculously twee and joyous on and, yeah, sure. and try and dance it off. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm sure I know the answer because every musician I've ever asked this to is just like, Oh yeah, straight away. Where's Money Cave CD? And it's like, yeah, yeah, what, what, totally. What are you yeah, going for? bang on, bang on, bang on. Absolutely. It's yeah, it's you. Yeah, I don't want to. It, it has to align. It has to be uh, completely sort of synonymous with how I'm feeling. And I think, and I think that's really healthy. Actually, I've given that that sort of question. And I think it's a great, a great question. I've given it a lot of thought, and I think there's a there's a lot to say behind sort of just feeling how you're feeling. Mm. Um, and not running, no, not running from it, not turning from it, um, in, in, embracing it and being like, yeah, I'm really, I feel really sad today. And if you, and yeah, I find if I listen to music, which just sort of sends me further, then eventually it will kind of pull me out because I felt it all. I've, you know, it's, it's kind of, I've, I've exhausted it. You know, I felt, I, I experienced the, the depth of it rather than hiding from it and being like, no, I'm okay. Yeah, like you say, put on something happy. No, put on Radiohead and kill me. <laughs> like, you know, but do you, that's do what you I want. Worry? Just sink. Do you ever worry that um, because in in the mid nineties, I had done it with a certain um, record, and and now it's killed it for you. You've and it's killed it for me now. So sure. And there was a band, there's a band called Spiritualized, and they released this amazing record with Ladies and Gentlemen Flat in His Face, and. It blew my mind and it caught me at a, a, a wonky time and it's and I listened to it on repeat and it's a beautiful record, but I love that band and I want to listen to it now, but it's just loaded with just feelings of misery. And it's mm. like... Yeah, yeah. And so I'm, I'm very careful that when I do lean to Nick Drake or Nick Cave, I don't know if it's just a Nick thing, um, but I'm like... Oh, I've got to be a bit careful here because I don't want this to just be that album, that sad album that, you know, if a track comes on in the car when I'm like on a way to my mate's wedding and all of a sudden I'm just pulling over, just sitting there in the lay by, just staring out the window. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to be careful. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it can be I, I think you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I think, yeah, I, I have I have the same thing. I have I have like songs and albums which I can link to certain days of my life. I'm sure you do too, you know, just certain certain it's like a smell sometimes you hear a song and suddenly you can be completely transported but i think and i think you're right i think you can ruin certain records i, I definitely have the same records that i listen to and it just reminds me of a terrible week i had or something yeah um but i think really we don't have the power to break that link if you see what i mean i think that if that if that connection is going to be made it's going to be made anyway and it's sort of it's more reflective of what we're going through than the music, if that makes sense. I think to me, it's sort of just I think you kind of just have to ride that one and accept that some of your favorite records could be yeah, yeah. <laughs> associated with memories that you don't love. Um, yeah, I don't think I've ever sort of managed to have the power over it to break that association. Could you pinpoint a record and I'm putting you on the spot here that that hit you? at a young age that maybe was the first time that you realised there was levels to music. And and it because as a child you hear sounds and it's like this is 
just music and it's uh, uh, but then I think sometimes a song whether it be lyrics or or uh, or, or, or the chords or however, whatever it is can make you go oh oh there's emotion involved in this mm, yeah. and and it kind of strikes you mm-hmm. and like if you you know could you sort of pinpoint any of those times I think there's been quite a few but I think the what yeah there's definitely one that springs to mind which is by a band called uh, Neutral Milk Hotel um and they or the songwriter behind neutral milk hotel is a guy called jeff mangum and he wrote this album called in the airplane over the sea um and it came out in the 90s but was re-released in the early noughties i heard it when i was about 16 i think and it was it i heard it at the age when i just sort of started taking songwriting seriously so I just started uh, doing it in college for like the band projects I was in and I was doing it at home and I was writing and recording my own music. And yeah, this album in the airplane of the sea is it's kind of a concept album written about Anne Frank, um, <laughs> which sounds bizarre, but it, and it's, it's, it's very heady. It's very, very kind of psychedelic um, and hedonistic and very, very, it's very strange to listen to because it's about, the, the songwriter was having these dreams um, about Anne Frank after reading her diary um, and wrote this whole album with re- in reference to her and these dreams that he was having. Um, and although it sounds sort of super esoteric and subjective and kind of unique to his experience, it kind of opened my eyes to, oh my God, I could write a song about anything. before Because before that, I was like, yeah, you have to write a song about love or sadness or hatred and you know i kind of was put in these boxes and yeah this album kind of showed me that really you can write a song about absolutely anything and it can be beautiful yeah Um, i mean listen to wet leg i mean christ look what they write about and they're bloody brilliant yeah exactly i think there's there's no there's no limitations on it and i think it took me quite a while yet to find that out it was that album because i thought hang on how has he done that how has he written a song about dreams that he's having about anne frank that's so um stupid but obviously it's not stupid because it's a phenomenal album (laughs) and yeah that kind of i think just really opened my eyes that album wonderful wonderful um while we're talking music let's start to 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 to, to wrap the pod up a little and and let's talk about your music what's going on oh okay so um yeah so we just got off of kind of two tours that went into each other that was with yeah the subways um where we met Kirsty, uh, and then we went into a band, uh, a tour with a band called Mom Jeans from California, uh, and they were really good shows. That was uh, Brighton, London, Cardiff, um, and a few others. And yeah, that was fantastic. Uh, we're now taking a little bit of a break uh, from gigs, just to basically uh, we've got our debut album coming out this year. Um, so like our full length album is yeah going to be this year. We've got it all recorded um, and it's just being mixed. So we're kind of uh, in the process of shooting back messages with our producer, making sure it's the way we want it and stuff, um, which is a very yeah. slow process. <laughs> will, but, um, uh, will, will Isaac be featuring on the, uh, on the, is it Isaac, the kid at the beginning? It is, yes. Who well, is Isaac? Sorry, who is he? No, that's great. Great education. Um, <laughs> Isaac is the son of a man called Seymour Quigley. Um, so Isaac Quigley and Seymour Quigley is is a promoter in our hometown, Barry St. Edmunds. <laughs> and he was the first he was he kind of made the band, really. He he put on our first shows. He really kind of um, championed us and got us got us going. Um, and he sent us this little video of his son uh, listening to that song. And we just thought, yeah, that has to go on the release. Uh, we haven't got anything planned to have him on the next release, but if we can shoehorn him in, then we definitely. I mean, how will. much older is he going to be now? He must have been about what three, four when 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 that release yeah. was put in. He's definitely yeah, he's definitely going to be a bit older. I think Seymour has a younger son, so maybe we'll get the younger son to make it more. <laughs> to make I love it. Really it. <laughs> it's awesome Wonderful. and my my, my six year old she absolutely adores the album as well so oh, amazing oh that's lovely yeah <laughs> and kim if people want to keep up to speed with everything that's happening um where's the best place to to follow the band yeah you can get us uh everywhere instagram facebook twitter etc everywhere it's just at gaff sandy um also on our band camp you can pick up merch 
um yeah you won't struggle to find us we have a stupid name gaffer tape sandy where did that come from oh, who, who is she is it a bit kinky can we talk about it <laughs> not at all kinky no gaffer tape is handy right um gaffer tape sandy gaffer tapes handy gaffer tape sandy Oh my god! I really <laughs> thought it was going to be a bit of sauce there. Oh, nope. I'm a little bit disappointed. I'm no, gonna... it's a stupid play on words. We <laughs> have lied about it a lot. Like we used to in interviews, whenever we were talking about the name, we'd just we'd come up with some really elaborate name, like a lie for it. But now I just tell people, no, it's a stupid play on words. Don't look too into it. It's <laughs> brilliant, Wonderful. fantastic. Kim, thank you so much for giving up your time today and coming on the podcast and speaking so openly. It's uh, it's been a real pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. It's been lovely. Wonderful. Nice We're going to press stop. Don't go okay, anywhere. Cool.